Hello, this is Dr. B. I appreciate you stopping by. Stand by. Let's get to it. Chapter 6 Going to Extremes Heavy Consequences Children are a great comfort in your old age, and they help you reach it faster, too. Lionel Kaufman A religious man, feeble and worn from age and illness, lay dying in a hospital room. His doctor had looked in on him earlier in the day. The man's fears were confirmed that he had a very short time to live. Later that day, he called his nurse and insisted that she contact his lawyer and have the doctor return. After some hesitation, she finally consented and called the dying man's attorney and paged the doctor. They both arrived a few hours later, one seated on the elderly man's right and the other on his left. They sat there, the old gentleman saying nothing. Time passed and both the attorney and the physician began to get frustrated. They both asked him, What is it that you want? The lawyer added, I make $300 an hour and I can't waste my time sitting here by your bedside. Then the doctor looked up and said, I make $5,000 an operation and I can't waste my time waiting here. The dying man looked at both of them and said, It's just that I wanted to die like Jesus, between two thieves. Sometimes the truth just needs to be told. The need to be courageous is another fact of parenting. The truth about forceful parenting requires being both bold and direct, but there are dangers inherent with power and position. Due to physical size, strength, and experience, a parent has an advantage over their child. This advantage can be used for good or for ill. Spanking is one notable area for such concern. Spanking Possibly the most controversial avenue of child discipline and correction to travel is corporal punishment, or what the old-timers would call a good whack on the hiney. This form of discipline has fallen into disrepute and is considered to be politically incorrect in an age of child abuse and neglect. Parents shy away from spanking their children for a variety of reasons. A few parents hesitate to spank because they themselves were physically abused as children and find too many associations between their own painful experience and spanking their child. Other parents are uncomfortable with touch in general, or the idea of causing physical pain for their child. Yet others see the act of spanking as abusive in and of itself. Some parents are afraid that they are going to make their child angry and the child will dislike them, so they avoid spanking. Finally, there is perhaps the most common influence that makes parents hesitate to spank their children. Influential idealists over the last 20 years have spun their web that spanking is barbaric. They have caused many parents to see themselves as unfit if they spank their children. Parents in recent history have been taught to use reason and be non-physical. This is the same period in which there have been incredible levels of violence and disrespect by children. The idealists believe that spanking teaches children violence and risks children becoming aggressive themselves. The question to ask is, then why are we seeing more disrespect and violence in our children? They attempt to back this theory up with twisted research. While they make their argument look good on paper, it has no relevant data to support it. Kindness doesn't mean being a wimp. Showing love to a child sometimes requires being tough and doing things we wish we didn't need to do. It is no kindness to a child to allow them to misbehave and go without consequences. Consequences teach needed lessons. Sometimes this means appearing harsh. Ultimately, the choice of whether or not to spank rests in the hands of parents, and rightfully so. The generations prior to the new age of don't spank were raised with various forms of correction and consequences for misbehavior, including spanking. What is now referred to as the greatest generation, those who lived and fought through World War II, had and used spanking as a staple of discipline. Nothing negative was thought about the practice. Even many of us today endured spanking and yet did not turn to violence or become convinced that violence is the way of working out problems and dealing with conflicts. If spanking really promotes violence, then why was it that during the age of spanking there was less violence in our schools and society in general? Respect in earlier days for authority was a thing taken for granted not begged for. In essence, by giving up the intervention of spanking, parents can be relinquishing a powerful tool in correcting their children and setting them on the right path. There are times when nothing else will push that reset button for a child other than a firm, calculated lick on the buttocks. We are not talking about slapping, punching, or kicking. Spanking involves the use of a deliberate stroke or two on the fleshy part of the rear end. This action reminds a child of who is in charge and what is and isn't acceptable behavior. Spanking is the last rung on the ladder of discipline. This consequence can be used when a child has been, in your face, disrespectful, has physically harmed others, or been unresponsive to other forms of discipline. However, before spanking a child, some rules for this form of consequence need to be considered. Rules by the Half Dozen 
When dealing with an area as controversial as spanking, some rules need to be laid out. Rules help define the parameters of what reasonable spanking means and how to use it. These rules will also tell us what is unacceptable. There is a line which the consequence of spanking can cross and become something other than discipline, something ugly. To begin with, it should be accepted that anyone with a history of violence, especially having an uncontrolled temper or having been guilty of physical abuse, has no business engaging in corporal punishment. The risk of harm is simply too high. Parents with such a history have relinquished their right to use spanking as a form of discipline. These people will need to rely on other forms of consequence for inappropriate behavior. However, most parents still have all their options. Let's take a look at the rules. Rule number one, never strike out in anger. Striking out in anger sends the message that a parent is out of control and that their aim is to hurt their child, not correct them. No love can be seen in this approach, and little positive purpose is evident. Lashing out also tells a child that it is all right to lose control and physically act out their emotions. This is the way that violence in a parent can prompt violence in a child. Modeling of bad behavior by parents is a powerful teacher. Children will bend to mimic what they see us do. Spanking needs to be a very controlled intervention because it is emotionally powerful and has psychological implications. Spanking is the only form of discipline that actually results in physical pain. However, done correctly, lessons are learned and the discomfort is not unreasonable. Rule number two, spanking should not be relied on as the principal form of discipline. When parents use a consistent program of discipline, that is escalating discipline, and spanking is used correctly, spanking will rarely be necessary. This truth applies in most cases with most children. Other forms of consequence when disciplining will be used 95% of the time. Generally, spanking as a form of correction should be used as the last level on the ladder of disciplinary consequences. However, one of the exceptions mentioned earlier was a child causing physical harm to others. This approach may be confusing for those who will hold to the philosophy that spanking teaches violence. However, when physical violence is not responded to with physical pain, the aggressor learns that they can get away with physically hurting others and still avoid any serious consequences for themselves. This lack of painful consequence only encourages them to become more aggressive in the future. A passive attitude towards aggression is what has encouraged much of the violence in our society today. Violence must not be tolerated. Passivity leads to fear. Further hesitation to take action and only encourages more aggression. If parents don't respond actively to violence and teach that there are severe consequences for aggressive behavior, then more violence will occur. One doesn't need to be a prophet to predict this future. Physically responding to aggression with assertion is a logical consequence. Assertion is an instinct under control. Violence is instinctive and must be dealt with instinctively, but in this controlled manner. Without restraint, aggression will grow. Part of our job as parents is giving adequate consequences to civilize our children and remove some of those natural tendencies to be violent. Violence doesn't solve problems, it creates more problems. Appropriate consequences for Johnny, who just struck little Mary across the face, is not telling him, don't do that. Rule number three, excessive use of spanking indicates that other problems need to be addressed. The need to repeatedly spank may be a result of poor parenting or may be indicating the need for professional help due to a child's extreme problems. However, leaving marks, bruises, breaking the skin, or hitting anywhere other than the buttocks can also define excessiveness. The backside is where to apply a firm hand, not the face or any other area of the body. A child's body contains bones and vital organs that must not be threatened. One of the most dangerous things that can happen is striking a child on the head. Hitting a child's head can cause injury to the brain, an eardrum, or an eye. The back, chest, and abdomen represent other areas where a child is vulnerable. Spanking must be controlled, focused, and restricted to the fleshy part of the buttocks. Rule number four. Use the minimum amount of physical force needed that will have the desired effect. Spanking should never be done using the parent's full physical strength. Strikes must be controlled and calculated. The number of strikes to the buttocks should usually involve between one and three swats. A parent should be especially careful with young children because they can be easily injured. So exercise even greater restraint in the power used when spanking them. Self-restraint is extremely important when spanking a child. When a parent doesn't feel they have self-control, chances are they don't. Rule number five, spanking should always be done reluctantly. If parents enjoy the opportunity to spank their children, then their motivation is wrong. Any parent that likes causing physical pain to their child has a problem. Enjoying causing pain is not discipline, but punishment, and may result in lashing out and going too far. Even when the spanking is controlled, a child will pick up on the pleasure that a parent gets out of the experience. 
This perception results in confusion and often sadness or resentment. A child acting these feelings out is a common side effect. We should also remember that spanking is usually not appropriate for children after they reach the age of 12, give or take a year. Other methods of discipline for teens and preteens need to be employed. Rule number six. If you can't trust yourself to spank appropriately, don't use this as a disciplinary option. As mentioned earlier, anyone who has physically abused in the past eliminates this corrective option. Like an alcoholic who can't drink, a parent who has physically abused in the past should not place themselves in a position where they could slip into abuse again. This would be too dangerous for them and their child. A parent who trusts themselves to spank must accept their responsibility, understand their purpose, and be able to show restraint. Assuming that a parent can abide by these six rules for spanking, the question of how to spank needs to be addressed. How to spank. Spanking should be used sparingly. However, if it is never used, the loss of a potent form of discipline may occur. When spanking is always used, it indicates a lack of balance in disciplining style. Our attitudes as parents are critical to our approach to spanking, as attitudes send messages to our children when they are being spanked. First of all, we must approach them calmly, quietly, and quickly. When parents don't remain calm, they communicate that they are not feeling in control. This notion results in provoking even more fear and defensiveness on the part of our children. Spanking as quietly as possible conveys a sense of deliberateness, purposefulness, and removes adding the features of chaos and confusion. However, don't expect the situation to be completely calm and quiet. Our children may protest and become emotional, but we can control our own emotions. Our self-control affects their level of self-control. Acting quickly implies that spanking should occur without delay. Taking rapid action maintains the important principle of tying the offense tightly to the consequence. Calm, quiet, and quick discipline reinforces appropriate behavior and diminishes the likelihood of inappropriate behavior in the future. However, spanking quickly should not be confused with rushing. Rushing can't be done thoughtfully or deliberately. Calm is not part of feeling rushed. Where? Another question that comes with spanking is, where? Spanking should occur, whenever possible, away from other people. Spanking in front of peers or family members can result in a double penalty because of the embarrassment factor. So if you spank your child in front of others, be sure of your reasons. There will be rare instances when a little embarrassment may be needed. However, there is also the possibility, when out in public, that someone would call Child Protective Services and label even appropriate spanking as abusive. Since spanking is not considered by many to be politically correct, it is prudent not to give opportunity to outsiders to criticize. There can, of course, be extenuating circumstances when it's not possible to spank a child away from others. When this occurs, parents must use their discretion. Usually, taking a child to another room of the home, or, if in a public place, taking them into a bathroom is wise. Spanking should also be delivered directly. While one warning may be appropriate, repeatedly implying or threatening spanking is not recommended. When the time comes that spanking is appropriate, a few swats to the buttocks should be delivered. One more question that many parents often ask is, should I spank with my hand or use something else? The answer often comes down to parental preference. However, a parent may want to consider that there were a lot more bones in their hand than there are in their child's backside. There is a much greater chance of a parent being injured by using their hand for spanking a child's bottom than there is of injuring their child. Therefore, a use of a reasonable paddle may be considered. A large, flat wooden spoon or a large paint stirrer that can be acquired at most paint stores are alternatives. Some wooden device that is flat, light, and easily controlled is best. The item should be set aside only for spanking, and the child should be aware of this special use. Positioning The position that a child needs to be in for spanking can be critical since there is no intent to do physical injury. A physical position that a child is in may make them vulnerable to being struck in areas or in ways that would not be appropriate. Where their body is in relation to their parent is crucial. A younger child can be laid over a knee or bed and the buttocks struck. An older child can be told to stand up, lean against the wall, or to bend over a bed or chair. Some children will comply with simply being told to stand still. It should be noted, however, that the instinct on the part of a child is to place their hands behind them in an attempt to protect themselves. Striking their hands could cause physical harm. A child's hands should be placed away from the buttocks. Often children need to be reminded to move their hands. A parent's call makes this go much more smoothly. If a child is reluctant, they can be reminded that they are going to get an extra swat if they don't move them. Once again, usually between one and three spanks is sufficient. If your child responds by saying, it didn't hurt, I don't care, or that didn't bother me, then a parent can respond by saying, well, then I didn't do it right, or then it wasn't enough. At that point, parents can add an extra swat. 
Usually, this tactic will prevent similar attempts at manipulation by a child in the future. It effectively calls their bluff. Clothing. Children should be spanked fully clothed. There should be no pulling the pants down or otherwise spanking while partially clothed. There is more risk of physical injury or undue embarrassment when hitting bare and unprotected skin. In addition, it's best to avoid spanking after showering, bathing, or swimming due to the moisture in the skin that will intensify pain. The intent of any form of discipline, including spanking, is to teach our children appropriate behavior, not to cause more pain than is necessary. Discipline also teaches that there are consequences for inappropriate behavior. The home is the classroom and parents are the teachers. The effect for most children who have been spanked is a resetting of the boundaries and a reminder of parental authority. It gives children a sense of who is in control, and the end result is usually a sense of calm and cooperation on the part of the child. It is almost like pushing a reset button on a belligerent computer. There are, however, exceptions to this result. Exceptions Some children do not respond well to spanking. Sometimes children have suffered in the past by being physically abused. Their response to even appropriate spanking can become exaggerated and complicated. Abused children often become overly self-protecting and can go to physical extremes and violence, thinking they will be seriously harmed if they don't defend themselves. Other abused children respond in the opposite direction. They often withdraw and become depressed. For unknown reasons, a small percentage of unabused children become extremely belligerent or violent in response to spanking. Fortunately, this is a very rare occurrence. If an unexplained reaction is seen in a child, a consultation with a professional is recommended to help know how to proceed. Getting help can determine the reasons behind this behavior and help find solutions. Some children have special needs. Dealing with special needs children can lead to excessive discipline if parents aren't careful. Excessive Discipline Excessive discipline is not really discipline at all. It is actually just another form of punishment by a different name. Excessive discipline involves being overly harsh and correcting. This tact includes either giving too much correction when consequences are needed, or giving correction when none is needed at all. The approach tends to prompt fear and discouragement in a child. Withdrawal, anxiety, or irritability can result for a child given excessive consequences. It thwarts exploration and the normal testing of boundaries and rules. A child's self-esteem and trust of a parent can be greatly affected. There is the danger of creating a wall between a child and their parent. A parent's role is to protect and direct, not to use and confuse. At times, overcorrecting can result in a child becoming excessively dependent on a parent. Children don't feel free or confident enough to make their own decisions. They often don't feel safe apart from their parent. Excessive discipline is a very successful formula for creating frustration, fear, or even depression in children. This is due to feeling controlled, weak, or afraid. Sometimes these factors don't surface for years, but will show up through exceedingly rebellious teenagers or grown-up children avoiding emotional closeness or having little to do with an overzealous parent. Often those who give excessive discipline have a need for control and power. Other motivations are fear of harm coming to their child, anxiety about being embarrassed by a child's behavior, or simply being ignorant of the effects that their best efforts have on their child. Given time, even a subdued child may experience a rebound effect. A child can go through a wild phase of getting into trouble, running away, having legal problems, or having serious conflicts with others. Overcontrol causes fear and apprehension. It doesn't teach how to make good decisions and deal with problems. Children have the need to explore and make some mistakes. When they aren't allowed to do this, their pent-up energy can explode in some self-destructive manner. Unfortunately, poor discipline easily feeds into normal adolescent rebellion. Once a child reaches those teen years, they realize they are bigger physically, stronger, and they have more control. Teenagers believe they have insight and know-how, and they begin to challenge more of the rules. Adolescents don't need parents to blend that natural rebellion with frustration and anger. The end result will be destruction. If a parent really wants to frustrate a teen, they merely need to discipline them for something they didn't do. Wrongful Discipline There are times when even well-intentioned parents make mistakes. It is possible that in the emotion and confusion of some crisis or conflict, that a child will get blamed for something they didn't do. This is especially common when there is more than one child involved. Sometimes it takes a while for the truth to come out, and in the meantime, a child may have been disciplined for something that they did not do. It can also happen that one child will deliberately set up another child to get into trouble. As with all mistakes that parents make, we need to take responsibility for our choices. Admitting mistakes teaches that everyone should take responsibility for their actions. What parents model, their children will reproduce. Upon making a mistake, there needs to be an admission that an error was made. Secondly, an apology should be made, including admitting what happened and what should have been done instead. 
Lastly, there needs to be restitution. Correction should be done as best as is possible. Often, we teach our children more through our mistakes than we do through our successes. By owning up to our mistakes, we teach a child that it is normal to make mistakes and that everyone is human. Even parents can blow it from time to time. Next, we teach children that it is okay when mistakes are made. Thirdly, a child sees that it's okay to take personal responsibility and that this is what everyone should do. Admitting errors also shows that it is good to correct for mistakes and make amends whenever possible. Lastly, we need to keep in mind that as parents, our positive example and correction of mistakes shows our love and respect for our children. These actions tend to draw parents and their children closer together, and there are few things in life more important than that. Conclusion Disciplining children is a necessary evil of life. Spanking can also be considered a necessary evil. Providing correction shows that we love them, care enough to take time and energy to act, and that we are willing to teach them right from wrong. But the need for discipline does not imply that a child's misbehavior is always the parent's fault. Genetics, personality, peer pressure, and the world in which we live can lead our children down the wrong path. Certainly, parents can contribute to a child's problems if they are not careful. However, children misbehave because this is part of their nature. It is part of being young and human.